what am I going to talk about if it's not about getting rich or about Drupal itself? I'm going to talk about poverty. And I'm going to talk about how everybody can, how it can happen to everybody and how I dealt with it and how I got out of it. And the role that the open source community uh, can play uh, within these circumstances. So, <clears throat> um, I want to show you what the effect you can have on the individual level and uh, the effect you can have um, for the whole family, for the next generation. So, uh, this is actually about diversity. And I can show you lots of numbers and statistics about why diversity is good for your company. But there are other talks about this and there are other, other talks that actually show you the benefits and how you can actually earn money by getting diversity in your team. It's also not about that. I'm going to show it on the individual level. I'm going to really take you along on a trip of my life and uh, show you how it's uh, done in, uh, in practice. So I hope you will join me on my journey for the wonderful uh, journey I call my life. So, <clears throat> for the most part, I hope that you will uh, leave this talk after it's over with a warm heart and a motivation to look a bit uh, further than your own uh, experiences. So what is poverty? What I experienced, uh, I would like to call privileged poverty because even though I didn't have any money, the people around me did. So I lived in a, in a I live in a very rich country. I live in the Netherlands. And that's completely different than you live in a poor country. I had um, ways to get my hands on resources that were not in my possession, but people around me had. So it's just finding ways to get into the ethics of people who had uh, stuffed them with loads of uh, materials that they don't use anymore. And that's different if you live in a country that, that has no support system or that has no... Uh, and not, a lot, not a, a lot of stuff around that you can get your hands on. So, um, was I poor? Well, according to the statistics, I was. So, these are the numbers that they use in the Netherlands. Um, I'm not sure if anybody uh, uh, knows the numbers in their own country, but they use a definition that's about, um, not just about getting uh, too, too little money to uh, pay for your bills, but to have this for a longer period of time. So if you've got one month of uh, this income, then you're not considered poor, but if you've got like a half year of it, that's when you start to feel it. And what are you feeling if you're getting poor? Well, that's, um, that's actually a kind of a staircase because uh, just imagine you lose your income. What would happen, right? You would start using your savings if you have any. Maybe you can ask your parents if you have parents with money. And that's, this will run out. And then maybe you have to sell your car. Or maybe you've got some jewelry or other stuff that you can sell and you can hang on a little bit more. And all of this will run out. And then when you've sold your car, you've sold your house, you're out of your savings, then you can go to the state and you can get on welfare if you know, your country has this. And this is the case in the Netherlands. You have to sell everything, then you can get welfare. And so now you're on welfare. What happens? Well, you start to buy cheap food, cheap food. Because the expensive food, the uh, nutritious food, the fruits and the vegetables, they cost more than just the pre, uh, what do you call it, the canned stuff. The, uh, nah. And the problem is, this kind of cheap food, it contains more fat, it contains more sugar, so your body changes and you become bigger. And you need to buy new clothes. You don't have money for new clothes. So you need to buy cheap new clothes and they don't fit very well and they wear and tear very easily. And that's what people see. People see you walking around and they, they, they know something is off, you know, it doesn't fit anymore, especially when your body type isn't a uh, confectional type. Like um, nowadays, if you go to H&M, if, if it fits you, you're very lucky. But if you're big or if you need some uh, medical uh, stuff going on, you, just, you won't find good fitted clothes. And this is what people see. So, um, for, for example, like I had, I had twins and I know if not, I'm not sure if you're well aware, but if you got pregnant <laughs> and your feet are like this in the beginning and then you get pregnant and you go like this. And so I need wider shoes, but wider shoes come from like a hundred euros or more. If you're on welfare, you can't pay that kind of money. So you, 
you're walking around on cheap shoes that fit, that, doesn't, that don't fit. You've got numb toes around the day, and they wear very easily. So you end up walking around, ill-fitted shoes, wet, sho wet uh, feet, and you're still paying more on shoes because these shoes break more, uh, more often. So now that I can actually afford um, quality time shoes, um, uh, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm able to pay them one time and they go off for a couple of years. And when I was poor, I had to, like every year, I need to buy new shoes because they just, you know, you get holes in them. So that being poor actually costs a lot of money. And when you go, um, you know, walking around um, while you're in poverty, you know, you can't cut your hair anymore, you can't go to the hairdresser, so you have to do it yourself, and people notice. And you're, you're walking around in clothes with like little holes in it, and people notice. And when you go to uh, look for work, you're not the first choice, because people don't see somebody who's poor, they see somebody who doesn't take good care of themselves. And that's the, that's the cycle that you're in. So, so being poor actually costs lots of money. Now, how do you get into poverty? There are some of these, um, that some of these parameters that are more statistically likely to end you up in poverty. And I would like you to just look at them, these are just, just some of them. And how many apply to you? It can happen to everybody. Maybe it's a divorce, maybe a lawsuit, maybe uh, you get sick or your mom gets sick and there's, health, there's hospital bills or stuff like that. You just want two paychecks away from getting into poverty. For me, it was this. Uh, generational poverty, well, obvious I'm a lady, um, and disabilities, mental health in general, and uh, I became a single parent, and for a time I was employed, but then uh, very little salary, and then I got unemployed. So this is the list, and let's start, this is generational poverty. Oh, I'm, I'm from origin, I'm an historian, so I start with old-fashioned photos. This is my grandma, this is my dad, that's not me, that's my aunt. Uh, the thing is, if your family doesn't have any money, you don't have any money. And they, they are, uh, what the, what are they? they worked for seasons on, on farms and stuff like that, so they had like three families living in one home. It was quite normal for, for those days. This is me. <laughs> Cute, huh? Well, it, my, it's, it's actually a very uh, regular story. My parents got divorced when I was four. And it, uh, in those days, you just moved with your mom and she moved to the big city, Rotterdam. Um, so we went with all my sisters to Rotterdam because her family lived there. Now, I'm not sure, but if you see a kid like this on your school, you should probably help out. Because my mom, uh, I'm not sure if she, <coughs> had problems because she was poor, but she was on welfare, obviously, single mom on welfare, and she started neglecting us big time. So, um, I was thinking seven already, seven, eleven, that I was roaming the city, just collecting empty bottles to get some money to buy some more food. You know, you can very easily shoplift if you've got these big sleeves and you can stuff and stuff in it. And, uh, well, <laughs> that's those kind of situations. And you would think in school that people would notice and adults would notice and it would help out. Yeah, that's just television, that's not real life. So what they see, they just see a unkept child uh, and other kids have run away from her because you know, she has lies, which probably is true because my grandma always used to wash our hair when we get in before we got to go to the living room with a smelly shampoo. So maybe they were right, but it didn't help. And I'm not sure if you heard about all these resources, researchers about you know, social capital or cultural capital, and that um, people have very low expectations from people that have uh, that are women or people from color or people that just find ugly even. They have lower expectations. And teachers actually grade your stuff lower based on how you look. And that's what happened. So, Adults just saw a rude kid with uh, uh, behavioral problems and they figured it was just my character's is, is flaw. So imagine the Pikachu faces of my teachers when, in, uh, 11, when, when I was around 11, you had to take a, a, a test from the state, a governmental test, to figure out the level of education you have to go to. And I actually scored like one of the highest in the class. 
And they're like, what did she do? Like, is it a fluke? Did she uh, copy somebody else's work? Because that's just how I looked, didn't fit what I expected a, a, a person to look like who had those cores. Well, <laughs> this can be kind of personal, right? If it's too much, just say so. You can just run away, it's also fine. Um, my home situation wasn't the best. It got worse. And I'm not somebody who just sits around waiting for it to end, so I run away. And what they do, they put you in a system. <clears throat> so I haven't told this in my work yet, so. But uh, this, if you're caught in the system, a system is not good for anybody, for not for any kid. Because it's just their job. They don't really love you, it's just their job. At the end of the day, they come home to their real kids. So, um, and as a child, you, you know, you're not being raised, you're just being fed, and that's a huge difference. So within a year, I uh, already built, and I went up north because I had a biological father. And I figured I could go live there. And they were lower middle class. This is my first uh, holiday. We went camping, like most Dutch do. We went camping in the Netherlands. And uh, you were thinking like, oh, now it's going up. Well, not quite. Because now the gender aspect comes in. Because I'm a girl. And uh, my parents, they were, still are Christian and traditional. So they figured, as a girl, you don't need a job, you don't need an education, you're gonna marry, you're gonna get kids anyway. So they put me on the lowest level of education. Yeah, that was a local high school in the village. Um, yeah, I'm still angry about that. <laughs> so, um, but that's the gender aspect. They don't expect much from a girl. So I finished up this uh, uh, MAVO, it's called. Like one year I did it, and then I had so high marks that they had, to, um, they had to allow me to go to the HAVO, which is one level up. So I finished the HAVO, and I was 17 when I graduated high school. And um, yeah, I didn't like it. So I went uh, to live on my own at 17, and I did the VWO, which is the highest level of high school that you are allowed, that you're, you, you can do in the Netherlands. And uh, I got a little bit rebels. So I was 17, living on my own in a little city. I had to pay rent. I had to pay for food. I worked uh, in the bakery at night, and uh, during the day I went to a high school. Um, and it just sucked. So <laughs> I got a mohawk. Uh, I met uh, the squad scene. I met some punk bands. And I became very proficient again in finding food and materials and stuff like this. If you go shoplifting and you're looking like this, you will fail. So we paired up. I would go in and all the uh, security would follow me. And then the normal looking people would go and you know, <laughs> grab the stuff. That's how you do it. So, uh, but I finished up this uh, high school. Uh, I went to university. Actually, I was the first in my whole family to go to university. Uh, this is me getting my... This, uh, how do you call it? No, this would be finishing my uh, university. I got good marks in modern history, specialized in women's history, did a lot of gender studies, you know, really setting up for the market, for the labor market. I didn't think about this. I just thought about, this is cool, I want to do it. And my uh, goal was to become a professor, just to prove everybody wrong. <laughs> uh, I did manage to get a teacher's job at university. I also became a junior researcher. Uh, so you think like maybe now is getting good, right? <laughs> You're going to earn some money. But apparently universities are very, um, they don't give proper jobs. They just give temporary jobs, part-time jobs. So on paper I work 24 hours, but in reality I work 70 hours a week. Still getting paid minimum wage for those 24 hours. So still no savings. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's how it goes. And you know, during these studies, I was actually surrounded by people who irritated me a lot. And you know why? Because they seem to have it easy. They seem to have, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they did easy lives. They had parents that loved them, and parents that even, you know, paid their rent, paid their studies. 
And uh, they, I, I just couldn't really connect. And this is called something like social capital, social cultural capital. They knew about world events because at home they had newspapers, they had books at home. And uh, I just got envy a lot, but every day it's a struggle and every day you're feeling like you're an imposter, you're not really belong and it just starts to wear you down. Oh, this is my research project, my dissertation. I was actually doing a dissertation on a biography of six uh, sisters from the 19th century. They were very, very, very rich six sisters. Um, yeah, but it didn't pay me any money. So, life can wear you down. And it's, it's, it's a slow process. It's maybe you've been through it yourself. You know, you get this feeling that every, every, every day is a struggle and you don't belong and people ask you what you're doing here because I was walking around in a, in a university as a teacher with these piercings and well, looking a little bit different. And at those days, people were still like assuming that you must be a student or you must be wrong or you must be in the wrong place. Guys actually asked me in which porn movie I was playing. I don't know why they asked me, why they assumed such a thing, but just based on the appearance that, yeah, that I had, it didn't fit the university. So I had a breakdown and I think it was about uh, 30 years old. It was just too much. So I left my partner and I went to uh, live in a squat again because if you've got no money, you can go on the streets or you can go live in a squat and I would recommend the latter. This is the squad I was living in. At the moment, it's getting evicted. Um, and I want to tell you a bit more about squatting, but I believe squatting is actually a lot like open source. Yes, it is, it is, it is. So, um, in the Netherlands, it was legal to squat until 2010. And you just, uh, the thing is, if the building was empty for more than a year, you could you're not allowed to break in the door, but the door would magically open. And you would enter and you would put in your furniture, like a, you need a bed, a chair, and a table. And uh, of course, a beer and some food. And then you could call up the cops and say like, we live here. And you will get something that's called domestic house peace or squatters rights. And it meant that police or other civilians were not allowed to enter the building without your permission. And if the owner wanted you out, they had to go to court and uh, to get an eviction order. So I spent a lot of time in court uh, defending the squads. And what we did from those squads is uh, a lot of political activism. Like, this is one of the demonstrations we organized. I um, think this was for uh, refugees. Like, everybody is welcome in the, in the city. And we, we also did some squads for, the, for refugees because they end up on the streets a, a lot of the time, right? So we had... Uh, this is food, not bombs at the time. We just collected food, free food from the market, uh, sponsored food, and we would cook it and then in the streets, you know, hand it out in order for uh, people to start thinking about overconsumption. And this is uh, the free shop we had. So, but in 2010, this became illegal. <laughs> and um, of course, it didn't stop us. It just meant that now, if you call the cops, they would, uh, um, they would more likely be, be uh, able to, to throw you out. So maybe you would spend some couple of hours or a day in the police cell, and that's it, and they would let you out again. Um, this is the demonstration against this new law. This is my, my band. Yay. Um, um, but, we, you know, of course, it, it's not going to stop us. Definitely not, because you need a house anyway. So what happens was, you know, at four o'clock, I would get a phone call, and I would get my crowbar out, and we would go with my van, with some people, go to a, a, a building that we had our eyes on and that we already researched, open it up, put stuff inside, barricade it. Next day, you call the cops, and they come, and they either evict you immediately, or they let you stay, and then you have a new place to put in... Uh, a new free shop or something like this. So, but in, the, in this period, I was still very depressed, burned out and vulnerable. So I figured if I would take a break and go on a bike to uh, Budapest, 
cycle to Budapest in a month, that this would clear my head. And I partnered up with a guy who I didn't really know, and who turned out to be someone who takes advantage of people. So I ended up pregnant. These are my twins, and this is where the single motherhood begins. And um, I remember I was back in, in, in the Netherlands after this uh, month trip to Budapest, and uh, taking, you know, I was doing a gig, and I'm feeling like probably should not drink, taking a test, and oh shit, yeah, pregnant. So I went with my uh, good girlfriend to the, uh, to the nurse and see what one of those invasive uh, scan devices. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, it's not very nice. And she was looking inside me at my uterus, uh, looking for heartbeats and babies, and she went, she went silent. And we were just sitting there like, everything all right? And she was like, very worried looking, and she was like, I see a heartbeat. Duh, yeah, I figured. Yeah, yeah. I see a second heartbeat. And she was like, all this, oh. So, you know, face full of worry and, and, and so zielig, um, pitiful. And we were like, oh, twins. Like, that's a great gift. If you couldn't have one baby, just get to it at the same time. It's wonderful. So, um, so I delivered two healthy babies. But the problem was, the first problem was, where am I going to live? Because I lived in a squad, remember? And squats are nice places, very nice. You don't want newborn babies in this area. No. So I went to the social worker from the hospital, because if you've got twins, you're gonna get all your scans in the hospital. And the social worker, I pleaded with her, like, I'm very stressed, bad for my baby. I'm very, very stressed, I need a proper housing. And in the Netherlands, you've got social rentals. And she actually was able to get me into one of those social rentals. It had a garden, this is my garden. So it was a very small place I could get my hands on, like 50 square meters, uh, two bedrooms. But you know, it's, it fits for one adult, two babies, perfect. Um, and this is, um, you know, in the Netherlands you've got private sector housing and uh, social housing. In the private sector, I would have paid like 1400 euros for this building. And because it was social housing, I was paying like 650 euros. And then you even get subsidization from the government. If you've got low income, they give you some money back to pay for the rent. So I was actually getting an affordable housing uh, for my uh, kids. It's just that there's so little housing. You have to leave the waiting list like 10 years before you can get something like this. And I got lucky with my social worker. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Housing, family, what are you going to do? Next problem. These houses, because uh, they, they come empty. I need to put in flooring, uh, painting, I need to put in furniture, I need to put in a cooker, a cooker, you know, stove, everything. And you remember, I was <laughs> pretty poor for a couple of years living in the squats. I didn't have any stuff. So what do you do? You open up a free shop. This is a free shop before my free shop. This is from another squad um, that got evicted and they, they did a, an item on the news because it got evicted. But you can see some images about how a free shop at those times uh, looked. And, and I opened up a, a similar one. And it was very nice because even though I was like pregnant like this, I had lots of uh, squatter friends who would just, you know, use something and then worked all night long to uh, build this uh, cabinets and clothes racks in the, in the building. And within no time, I could uh, open up the free shop with stuff that came from this one and it became popular instantly. So, but what is a free shop? Do you know the concept? You got something in your country maybe? It's a, it's a shop where you can go without any money and nobody cares, you just, everybody can go in and take whatever they need and go out and that's it. And it's a political activism <laughs> idea behind it because we live in a capitalist society and everybody's going like, you need to buy stuff and you need to, buy new models and you need to buy uh, new fashion, you know? And it just ends up with people with lots of stuff in their attics, in their homes that they don't use, uh, dumps full of, of older models that are still good, but you know, they're old, so it gets thrown out. And this is a, a way to get secondhand stuff or even new stuff. One day we got somebody's wine cellar, like we got a hundred bottles of white and, and red wine to give away. 
So all this stuff um, is our own economy actually going on. So this is how I got all the stuff I needed for my babies and for my home. And I know, uh, you know, you might not be able to do this in your own country, but if you ever get poor, just go on Facebook. There are a lot of free groups that are giving away stuff. Um, there are a lot of ways to get your hands on some money. This is me going to a second-hand market to sell stuff, uh, just to, to earn some uh, more money. I, this buy car that I got for free from one of those free uh, Facebook groups. So that's how, uh, you know, you start making your own washing liquid. Wouldn't recommend it, still smells. Start that, uh, you, uh, you, uh, I used washing uh, nappies, washable nappies for the kids. It's great for the environment, not great for yourself. Um, you know, you start inventing stuff and you start trying stuff just to get your hands on money. Um, so that's how you survive. So next is, um, I had a kid who turned out to have a disability. For example, I needed to buy her, like this is, this is my old house. Uh, and you can see all the, all the stuff, you know, uh, the brown cabinet, white cabinet, tables. I got the table from somebody who wasn't in present at the time. So I just took it. <laughs> and the rest I found at a, a, or in a free shop or at the side of the road. You know, people throw out so many stuff. Just, you need to know when the dump is going and then you go in the streets and you collect stuff that you need. Um, but some things you can't buy, like... My kid needed a bike, a special bike for kids with disabilities. It costs like 150 euros. Maybe that's not much for you now, but in some point of your life, it might be too much. So I went on Facebook and just asked people like, Jim in please. And they did, so I was able to get her this bike. So this is my uh, little kid. And uh, as a baby, uh, you could already see that something was wrong, you know, she had not so much control of her limbs. She was not crawling in the right way. I went to hospital to hospital until we got a diagnosis. It's a cerebral palsy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but there's a lot of different uh, ways it can uh, affect a, a child. Um, this is her first wheelchair. And as you can see, I already also cut their own hair because, you know, you can't afford a hairdresser. So I'm still sorry for the kid. But... Uh, um, this meant that I was, you know, in, in this time I was still looking for a job. I got rejected everywhere, but I was still looking for a job. And then uh, some lady from the city came in and she said, you need to stop looking. You need to go just stay on welfare and just uh, be a provider for your kids 100% of the time. You know, you're a mother, you should just stay home and take care of the kids and just don't start, you know, stay on welfare. And, you know, I... I don't want that, I don't want that. I, I knew about my mom, I don't want to be a welfare mom. So, I had new job requirements. It needs to be a job with flexible hours. It needs to have high earnings, because I need to pay for my kids. And do you know any job or any sector that allows you to you know, leave in the middle of the day to go to the hospital with your kids uh, on a regular basis and that pays enough for you to support like two kids, one of, uh, with special needs. I know you do. It's the IT, it's the IT sector. And because there is so, uh, we all here talking about how to get new blood into Drupal. There's also this whole talk about how to get new people into IT, you know. Uh, and my, my uh, city at the, at the time, they offered a free crash course in IT for people on welfare, for, on people on welfare. So, I joined, it was insane. It was four months of pure horror. I don't know how you call it, blood and tears, stuff like that, but I made it. I made it. I learned to build websites using PHP. PHP, PHP, yeah, that one. And, uh, <laughs> and CSS and all the stuff, some Laravel. We didn't do any Drupal, unfortunately. Um, so I was working on, you know, on the, on the, in, in, at home with my kids around and start starting building websites and learning about IT. And this is me at the graduation of this course. And my group was one of the top and we won the, a prize of the best products uh, that we made. 
And because I won this prize, I actually got the attention of a recruiter. And he apparently he was there before, but he just, uh, he didn't want to add me before because I was different and acted not like a typical IT person should act. So, but now that I won this prize, he was actually like, I'm gonna take a chance with you. And he had a, uh, two jobs lining up in Drupal at the Dutch government. And he picked nine persons from the course to go with him uh, to get those two jobs. And he was allowing me to come in. And I figured, government, government. Yeah, I'm not, coming, I'm not gonna get in. I'm gonna try, I'm not gonna get in. Because you need a code of conduct to work for the government. And you remember, you know, squatting and police stations and stuff like that. I figured, you know, I wouldn't get in. And to be sure I wouldn't get in, <laughs> I brought in the CD from my punk band uh, with lots of lyrics, political lyrics, you know, anti-capitalism, anti-Nazism, and uh, anti-government, pro-beer and party. And I figured, you know, I need to be noticed. Nine people are coming. There's just two jobs available. First thing you need to do is be noticed. So I figured I will bring it in and see what happens. So, um, uh, and I opened up my laptop and I started researching Drupal. And that's when I learned that there's something like open source and this whole community going on. And I was like, oh, but I know this. It's an international community working together voluntarily to share stuff. I know this. This is like uh, political activism. This is a social uh, experiment. This is something for me. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you feel the same way about Drupal as a, well, uh, almost an anarchist revolution going on. But in my mind, that's what it is. Please don't change my mind. <coughs> so I saw a lot of, uh, a lot of parallels with my experience and their experience. And uh, I don't know why, but I actually got into the second round and then actually I got the job. And the, he, the guy, the boss told me that he hired me because I was different. And he hired me to steer up this group of guy, male developers that they had, they were all like same type of persons. And he wanted to change things, so he did. It, had, it brought a lot of uh, specific problems in itself but I got a job, I landed a job. And this pays well, and I could pay for my kids. And uh, I could join the Dutch uh, Drupal Association. Very grateful to be able to uh, put my energy now in the open source community, because I'm not squatting anymore, obviously. Um, I was able to get married and uh, bought a new house, a big house for my kid with a wheelchair that can just go, you know, roll around. Um, and this is something that you can mean on an individual level. If you give uh, a person with a weird curriculum vitae a chance, you don't just help one out, you help your own organization out. Because now I'm a, an ambassador of open source solutions for the, go for the government. We build a, a Drupal distribution for the Dutch government. Um, I was, with my uh, skills in communication, I was able to help uh, make my organization more visible within the Drupal Association, but also within other uh, governmental organization, organizations. So I proved to be actually a, a valuable new kind of asset for this organization. So if you give people with a different life path who look different than you, if you give them a chance, you're not only helping your own organization and yourself, but you're helping this person and, uh, and the next generation. I got a new kid, <laughs> and I got a Drupal uh, t-shirt from, uh, from my team uh, member at the time. And uh, as you can see, uh, they now grow up in a carefree environment. I can pay music lessons for them, and they can, uh, for my first salary, I bought them a new bike. It was just, it's a life change. I now wear shoes that actually fit and that are comfortable and that don't tear every, every year. So it's a huge difference that you can make, and you can help make, uh, your organizations by welcoming just weird people <laughs> and uh, give them a chance. And I hope that's what you're gonna do. And I hope that's, 
you know, that you just, just, I'm not sure if you heard about all this research, but if they're, uh, if they're an application progress, they tend to hire people that look just like they do. And that's why males hire males, and preferably, you know, if you're a white male, they hire white males. And, and uh, please look further than this, and you will broaden the horizons, and you will be subsidizing, uh, of not subs helping out the new generation. So that's it. I just want to remind you that if you bring in somebody from a poor uh, background, just be sure that you're uh, giving them enough money to sustain a life. Because when I was poor, very weird, but the university, my, my uh, university would run out of office supplies all the time. I don't know why. But, uh, you know, and the coffee would just disappear and toilet paper would disappear. And, uh, you know, in some squats you didn't have any water, so I would just go uh, after office hours, I would walk, <laughs> I would go on my bike with the jerry cans, just fill up the water and take it with them. So if you bring in people with different experiences, you need to make sure that they get a different salary so that you don't run out of office supplies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Esmeralda, for a great story. Thanks for being willing to share your life like that. Yeah, free tickets. Any, any questions? <laughs> so if you've got, yeah, and if you've got some, something to share, you just want to share it without everybody hearing it, I will be around, and uh, it's fine. Um, my question was, did you have any IT knowledge before you stepped in? Uh, and how long did it take to feel comfortable with also other I'm still developers? Not, I'm still not comfortable. Uh. <laughs> no. Like I became, uh, with the help of free Drupal tutorials on YouTube, um, I could learn about Drupal before I, I met this uh, government agency and was able to actually get a feeling like, what is it? It's a CMS system, what, you know, it's a complex CMS system, oh my God. You know, you know the learning curve, like all the people falling to the death from it. It's, uh, there's a learning curve about Drupal that's very famous because it's just too steep and you fall off. And I'm still not, I'm a Drupal site builder, but I'm not a very, I'm not a very good Drupal site builder. But the guy that had a second jo job at my, uh, at the same, you know, at the same time, they hired two people, right? Me and another guy. And this guy, uh, he was single. So I, I didn't have any energy at night to put up the laptop and work some more and learn some more. Do they still, uh, they still look at them and like, hey, what's your progress, what's his progress? Well, he went way farther. He was <clears throat> single, he didn't have all this, ba this baggage. So he is now almost senior developer. And, and well, I'm still a duple side builder. But you know, <laughs> that's still something. And I've got, uh, uh, with my other qualities, I've become a com uh, communication ambassador. They didn't have anybody to write articles or just to make, you know, do interviews or stuff like that. That's something that I could pick up or organize stuff. So there's just different uh, qualities. They hired me to build websites, but I brought in more. Yeah, but I'm still not. <laughs> Is that a question? No. Got time for one more, if anybody has anything else they'd like to ask. No? Okay, well, thanks ever so much for coming, and thank you, Esmeralda.